audio test, uh, audio test, uh, one, two, one, two, one, two, audio test from the EV room. Audio test, Pascal, do you hear me? Okay. Audio test plus French booth, please. Could you say some words? Yes. Audio test, one, two, one, two, audio test plus French booth. Pascal, est-ce que tu entends bien la cabine française? Ok, c'est tout bon. Merci beaucoup.
This is an audio test, one, two, three. Good afternoon.
right, there's someone in the studio. Could you please uh, frame on me? This is Chris in Geneva. We're about to do a quick audio test to the, um, to, we're gonna do a quick audio test from WHO headquarters here in Geneva, Switzerland. We have a few guests that are joining us remotely and we're just gonna do a quick test to their systems. So journalists that are on the line, please bear with us and I can see people are connecting to us now. So we're gonna have uh, Professor Mervyn. Uh, how are you, sir? If you could please turn on your camera and do a quick audio test. Good afternoon, uh, Chris. Thank you very much for, for the wonderful opportunity to share some thoughts with you. Uh, I hope that you are able to hear me loudly and clearly. We can indeed, sir. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. And Professor Ye Jean, how are you? Welcome to our meeting. Thank you. How are you? I'm doing fine. And it's my privilege to participate in this meeting. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. We see you loud and clear. And we have Dr. Tedros, uh, who is on the call, joining us remotely. Dr. Tedros, do you see and hear me OK? Dr. Tedros, do you see and hear me OK? I can see you, but I can't hear you, sir. Dr. Tedros, if you hear us okay, you need to unmute on your side, sir. There we go, that might be working now, sir. I see you've unmuted. Do you hear me okay? Is it working now? It's working perfectly. Thank you so much, sir. I'm glad we can make this work. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. And then I think we have one last person. We have Marta Lado, my good friend, joining us. How are you, Marta? It's nice to see your name on the system today. I look forward to, there you are. So nice to see you. Uh, we don't hear you though. You have to unmute yourself, please. No, you need to just probably unmute yourself on the Zoom. And there, I can see you're unmuted now, so can you try talking? No, we don't hear you, unfortunately, Marta. Can you hear me now? I can hear you now perfectly. So nice to hear your voice. Maybe. Yes, can you hear me now? Maybe now is working. Hello. It's very good. Thank you, Marta. Thank you so much okay. for joining us today. Linda. Thank you. Okay, all our guests that are online, I'm going to you can ask you to mute at this point, uh, and we hopefully will start as soon as our other guests join us here. In the executive boardroom of the World Health Organization in Geneva, thank you so much for joining, and please stand by.
Hello, everybody. I am Fadela Shaib, speaking to you from WHO headquarters in Geneva and welcoming you to our Global 19 press conference today, November 2nd. Um, the Director General, Dr. Tedros, will be joining us remotely. Present in the room are Dr. Mike Ryan, Executive Director, Health Emergencies, Dr. Maria von Kerkhoff, Technical Lead for COVID-19, Dr. Sumia Swaminathan, our Chief Scientist, Dr. Mariangela Simao, Assistant Director General, Access to Medicines and Health Products. Um, welcome all. As usual, we have simultaneous interpretation in the six uh, official UN languages, Arabic, Chinese, French, English, Spanish, and Russian, plus Portuguese and uh, Hindi. Um, we will be joined remotely by several guests that Dr. Tedros will introduce. Now, without further ado, I will hand over to Dr. Tedros for his opening remarks and for him to introduce our guests. Dr. Tedros, you have the floor. Yeah, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I want to start by saying that WHO has been following closely the situation with Typhoon Goni in the Philippines. This is the strongest storm of 2020, and WHO will work with the government to ensure emergency medical care is reaching those that need it. Our thoughts are with all those affected. I have been identified as a contact of someone who has tested positive for COVID-19. I am well and without symptoms, but will self-quarantine in the coming days in line with WHO protocols. At this time, it's critically important that we all comply with health guidance. This is how we will break chains of transmission, suppress the virus, and protect health systems. Over the weekend, we saw that while many countries have brought COVID-19 under control, cases in some countries in Europe and North America continue to spike. This is another critical moment for action, another critical moment for leaders to step up, and another critical moment for people to come together for a common purpose. Seize the opportunity. It's not too late. We all have a role to play in suppressing transmission, and we have seen across the world that it's possible. We have released videos featuring multiple countries demonstrating their comprehensive responses to COVID-19. This includes New Zealand, Rwanda, Thailand, the Republic of Korea, Italy, and Spain. And today, a new video was released that highlighted Mongolia's success in responding to COVID-19. Mongolia has so far had no deaths or local transmission. And what Mongolia and all these stories show is that there are shared lessons that we can all learn from. And we all have a role to play in suppressing transmission. In some countries, we're seeing cases go up exponentially and hospitals reach capacity, which poses a risk to patients and health workers alike. This is leaving health workers with difficult decisions to make on how to prioritize care for those that are sick. To understand more about how hospitals can prepare and cope with COVID-19, I'm pleased to be joined by three distinguished health specialists. First, I would like to introduce you to Professor Yae, Yae John Kim, who is joining us from the Republic of Korea, Korea to reflect on their experience tackling COVID-19. Professor, you have the floor. Thank you very much. 
Thank you very much for the kind introduction, Dr. Tedros. I send you a warm wish that you stay healthy and be back to your office after an eventful quarantine. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. It's my privilege to share our experience with the COVID-19 outbreak in Korea. Uh, Korea has the first patient around January 20th, similar to other countries. And in February, March, we had the second highest number of COVID patients next to China in the world. But now we have a lower number of cases than many other countries. The first thing that I would like to mention about Korea's response with COVID-19 is the rapid PCR testing and rapid isolation during the initial large outbreak in Daegu area and the following outbreaks later on. Having experienced the mars cov outbreak uh, in 2015, we knew that setting up a PCR test and expanding the test capacity would be very important to investigate and also work on any uh, outbreak situation. In fact, um, the PCR testing was available in many clinical laboratories of hospitals, including my hospital, um, around during the first week of February. And uh, in addition, to speed up the test uh, co sample collection um, with the limited test rooms, Korean physicians uh, developed an idea of drive through test facilities, which is already published in the literature in many other countries also used that ideas. And we had a community treatment center for mild cases, and that was somewhat unique for Korean response to prevent any transmission in the community and also in the household. There are pros and cons in this community treatment center, and we are continuing our discussion um, for these matters. And secondly, the public hospitals, we have public hospitals and the private hospitals, and these public hospitals have been prepared for high risk communicable diseases for the past couple of years, especially since uh, before the MERS outbreak, but also strengthened since after the MERS outbreak. And this time, these hospitals were used, uh, utilized for COVID-19 patients. When the hospitals were filled with the patients um, and with the critical patients um, who could not be moved, uh, physicians from other hospitals and other cities volunteered to help the patient care. And in addition, when the hospitals uh, were saturated, uh, the private hospitals also took care of the patients when the uh, overflow occurred. And another important aspect of of this COVID-19 in Korea is the collective joint effort of um, the experts in the field with the health authorities, which we also ex exercised during the MERS outbreak as well. For the patient care side, we had a um, clinical, central clinical uh, task force from the beginning to share the clinical knowledge and experience for the patient care. And for COVID-19 response side, we had a coalition of the response team in the field of infectious diseases, uh, infection control, laboratory medicine, clinical care, pulmonology, epidemiology, and et cetera, and all worked together with the Korea CDC now uh, Korea, CDC, Korea Disease Control and Prevention Agency. Now it's an agency. This health authority also shared the information uh, with the public on new, any new patient numbers and outbreak situation openly, and, and this updates uh, with a daily press release. The Korea CDC, uh, former Korea CDC, continued the epidemiologic investigation when other countries uh, um, discontinued the further investigation when they have a, a large outbreak. Whenever, however, we continue the epidemiologic invest investigation when, whenever uh, there was an outbreak and whenever possible. And now we came to learn actually many more situations that can be linked to further outbreak. So that was also a lesson that we learned from uh, the various investigations we performed. And finally, most of all, the participation, cooperation, and compliance of the public, the community members of the nation, was mo one of the most important aspects of COVID control in Korea. We encouraged wearing a mask from the early phase of the pandemic and avoid a mask gathering later on. However, we did not lock down the country or close the border, but only performed the variable degrees of social distancing according to the epidemiology situation. <laughs>
Although we had a second wave in um, Seoul metropolitan area mid-August and September, the outbreak was controlled uh, with the various collective efforts. Many Koreans remember the outbreak in 2015, and their mindsets are also changed since then, and know that public cooperation and compliance is important for the safety of everybody, and many followed the guidance with positive acceptance. Now we are preparing for the winter, like any other countries, while the, uh, and the health authorities actually reorganizing the social distancing levels from three levels previously now to uh, five levels in the future. So we are trying to prepare ourselves with our best efforts. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor. And I would now, I would now like to hand over uh, to the Professor of, uh, to Professor Mervyn Mer of University of Wits, South Africa. Professor Mer is also Director of Intensive Care at Charlotte Maxike in Johannesburg. Sir, you have the floor, and thank you so much for joining again. Precious thanks, Dr. Tedros, uh, for the very kind invitation. Uh, it's been a real privilege and pleasure to participate in this press conference. I'd also like to take this opportunity just to extend and pay tribute and homage to the wonderful healthcare workers around the globe who've really done amazing and, and committed work. From a South African perspective, we are a low middle income class country with a population of around about 60 million people. Uh, and there are huge discrepancies between the haves and the have nots. In fact, 55% of South Africans live on under $2 US dollars per day. We also have, as was alluded to in the earlier presentation, a public health care system as well as a private health care system. But 84% of the country's 60 odd million people are dependent on state health care. And in many areas, these are extremely resource limited. And so I'm going to focus on some of the elements in our own institution, which served as the major referral hospital uh, in Johannesburg, uh, in terms of what we did and how we in fact prepared and in, most importantly, many of the lessons uh, that were learnt that I think have been exceptionally useful for all of us. We first began to hear, as did the rest of the world, uh, what was going on in China in early January. And very shortly thereafter, we in fact got together a group of role players and had our first meeting. You know, so shortly after, uh, things were made public knowledge. And within the context of the first meeting, we'd already drawn up a protocol. Uh, that protocol over the ensuing months and, and, and weeks was subsequently refined and in fact widely rolled out. And uh, <clears throat> what we in fact realized at the time, and it was something that I felt quite strongly about with the preparation, and we had the benefit of several months versus individuals in China, the US, Europe, uh, and elsewhere before, in fact, our surge occurred. And so we really tried to maximize, bearing in mind our resource limitation, everything that we feasibly could. And one of the things that we felt, and I certainly felt very strongly about, was that there were plans to put up field hospitals that has, as had happened elsewhere in the world. And I felt one of the most important things we could do was look at our own infrastructure, our own hospitals, and expand capacity within those. To put into perspective, as someone speaking from an intensive care background, we have about 70 to 80 intensive care specialists in South Africa, half of whom don't practice intensive care. So we had 40 or less intensive care specialists to look after 60 odd million people, uh, a significant percentage and proportion of, of which who may effectively have required intensive care uh, facilities and care. And so within a short period of time, we partnered with various social responsibility partners, addressed the issues of ventilators, oxygen in the country, getting sufficient masks, making sure that in fact we could expand our existing capacity and within no time our own ICU capacity in Johannesburg was more than doubled. We also made sure we started a nursing upskill course 
so that we could actually provide adequate care for the patients. And we made sure that human resources were extended a little so that even though we didn't have the specialist care, we could employ people who could often be trained quite readily to deliver appropriate intensive care in our institution. And in fact, what this effectively has done, we were able to do that within a few weeks. And so we have more than doubled our capacity. As you may be aware, South Africa now ranks number 12 in terms of the most um, commonly affected countries. We were number four or five at one stage. And in my own hospital, at a, at a point in time, we had close to 400 patients in a packed ICU with this expanded facility. And so we felt that in the context of things, in fact, every challenge brings opportunity. And so we try to maximize the opportunity. And this ICU that we've created and expanded will exist beyond COVID. In fact, we were able to continue providing absolutely essential services for patients with non-COVID disease, very relevant in resource-limited settings like tuberculosis, HIV, ongoing surgical issues. And we made sure that we could maximize those and have an expanded facility. Additionally, with the preparation and some of the work actually done in our own institution many years ago, we took a leaf out of our own experience with varicella pneumonia. And many individuals who may be, in fact, online currently would know that, in fact, from our institution many years ago, 1998, there was a seminal publication that described the benefit of corticosteroids in critically ill patients with varicella pneumonia with massive reductions in mortality. And so very early on, we in fact, in our armamentarium of appropriate supportive care, oxygen supportive care, appropriate fluids and so on, we added corticosteroids long before the recovery trial in fact became well known. And in fact, when compared to other uh, colleagues elsewhere in the country and elsewhere, in fact, our mortalities were dramatically different, um, despite the fact that we were dealing with a very similar severity of illness. And so we recognized that, as is often the terminology that's put out there, you can do more with, it, more with less. But what we did recognize, and I think a very important lesson to learn, is not to do less for more. So don't expend and expand issues that are actually non-feasible. And so a huge amount was done by just a few for so very many. We also learnt most importantly, so the first issue was preparation. Second was that communication is absolutely pivotal. And at the outset, based on what was happening elsewhere in the world, there was massive fear, panic and anxiety. And we set up a daily, really effective debrief in the morning and in the evening where everyone, in fact, had a voice from every single healthcare worker. That was from the security people to the porters, to the nursing staff, to the medical staff, to everyone who had a role to play within the context of delivering care. And when we did this, we were able to overcome all sorts of issues take decisive decisions which were then very easily implementable and allow people to feel supported. And in fact, this made a massive difference. At the outset, we had several healthcare workers that were infected. We initiated our own PPE training programs. And within no time, people who initially veered away from wanting to be involved with volunteering, we were doing more with less, but not less for more. And so fabulous issues and everyone ultimately bought into this. We felt it was very relevant to maintain simplicity. In a country like South Africa, we have to rely inherently on clinical acumen. An excellent clinical acumen can make a massive difference. So in my opinion, being poor doesn't mean poor care. In fact, with creativity and initiative, in fact, excellence can be achieved. And so these were some of the lessons that we in fact learned along the way. We learned to be flexible based on what uh, was being shared abroad at lots of interactions with colleagues abroad as well. And ultimately, in a nutshell, 
I think those elements allowed us to actually provide care that was equitable in a resource limited setting with what was going on elsewhere in the world and in fact possibly have some outcomes that currently look as favorable if not better despite the resource limitations and so I think I want to remind everyone out there that it's an absolute privilege to in fact be within this profession and we should never forget that. Another thing coming from Africa that I think we need to take out and share is what we call the spirit of Ubuntu. And Ubuntu is a very, very special word that means never forget to be compassionate and humane, both to patients and other healthcare workers. That went a massive way to making a huge, huge difference. And then finally, I had the fortune to grow up in a country where we were exposed to an individual of the magnitude of, of Nelson Mandela. And he was someone who, who taught all of us around the globe that we can overcome difficult situations, like the situation that we are dealing with, and that it doesn't matter how turbulent the scenario is, how difficult and how many obstacles we face. And something that stuck in my mind out of the many words of wisdom that he shared with all of us around the globe was a quotation that went something as follows. What counts in life is not the mere fact that we have lived. Rather, it is the difference that we have made to the lives of others that will determine the significance of the life that we lead. And if we take that, that particular element of wisdom out, we can all get through this. Nothing is impossible. In fact, I often try and turn the terms around and, and use the terminology, impossible is nothing. So I'd like to share some of those elements with you. Extend really gracious and humble thanks for this opportunity um, and really let everyone know out there that even in the most difficult scenarios, we can get on with things in a simple way. Simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. A huge amount can be achieved, and we, in fact, can change the lives of many individuals. Thank you so very much for this opportunity. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Professor Mer, for sharing your lessons from South Africa's COVID-19 response, Ubuntu. Uh, finally, I would like to introduce you to Dr. Marta Lado from uh, Spain. Uh, Dr. Lado was the Chief Medical Officer for Partners in Health in Sierra Leone and the Senior Clinical Lead in the Intensive Care Unit for COVID-19 at 34 Military Hospital in Freetown. Uh, Dr. Lado, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Tedros, for the introduction and for the invitation to be able to share some of the experiences that we have had in in Sierra Leone in the last uh, in the last months with this pandemic of COVID. No, like we we have had a, our first case in Sierra Leone the 30th of March of 2020, and so far until today, which is more than six months, we have had like. 2,366 cases. Uh, compared to other settings and other countries, definitely is quite a low number of cases. And it's not really related with low level of testing or because of not being able to acknowledge the infections that we have in the community. No, probably there are like a multifactorial system about like young age, the weather, probably cross immunity with other coronaviruses, and also some specific measures that I would like to bring up with all of the audience in terms of a, being able to analyze how much our context in a low income a country like Sierra Leone can affect the way that we respond to things when maybe other middle of high or high income countries probably are struggling a little bit more. I want to remember everyone uh, to remind everyone that we had like a very big outbreak of Ebola from 2014 until 16, and that it uh, killed and affected many of our population here in Sierra Leone, but also attacked deeply our healthcare system and made it even a little bit more weaker than it, what it was. So 
when all this COVID epidemic was going on all around the world and mainly Asia and moving into Europe and U.S., Sierra Leone was able to start putting in practice some of the things, some of the lessons learned during the Ebola outbreak that we lived in 2014-16. One of them is we were one of the few African countries, like considered low-income countries, that had five molecular lab functioning in the country. So that, that was meaning that we were able to do PCR testing, like real-time PCR, uh, to most of the different regions of the country, like the north, south, east, and west. And two of them were located mainly in the capital, where most of our cases of COVID happened. Another thing is the contact tracing. We had already developed like a very good system for contact tracing during Ebola, about like one patient is affected, being able to follow up all the relatives and all the close contacts, having like a proper system of a 117, like a free hotline where people can call whenever they feel sick and they want to be tested, or just to report any kind of infection around their environment. And that has also definitely made a big difference in the way that we were able to to do contact tracing and surveillance in most of our our population. No? The third one was about like the IPC, no IPC trainings, PPE. Those were things that Sierra Leone was more than expert. No, like I was here in Sierra Leone before Ebola, so I had the privilege and also the the experience of living here all the outbreak of Ebola, and we spent a lot a lot of time in doing IPC training how to wear the PPE, how to don and doff, et cetera, how to set up treatment centers, how to do isolation units, how to make sure that most of our staff are able to be protected when they are working so that we can reduce the hospital acquired infections. So these are things that we learned from Ebola and we all were aware that Ebola was not COVID, but definitely has made like a ground where we were able to start working in a more easy way and probably faster than many other countries that we were seeing around. The other thing was about like the lockdowns and the closure of the airport definitely had made like a big, like a big difference. And a, that has made like many new cases not being able to come inside of the country. So we were able to control our population. The reality is that we don't have much tourism as probably we uh, we see in other African countries. So that means that most of our people that come inside of the country come for some kind of probably business or development work. So we were able to control with the closure of the airport and the lockdowns between different districts. We were able to control the movement of people. So we were able to identify cases in the capital and being able to follow them quite closely compared to probably other regions where they are not so used to be able to put these measures in place. And for, for all of us, one of the most important lessons learned, and, and this is what we are now trying to focus more and more, is uh, how we were able to develop like a critical care training for our healthcare staff. So before COVID, we only had one ICU in the country with only one intensivist for 7 million population. Uh, so that means that, uh, as you all may imagine, Jane, like the, the basic idea about monitoring patients, about vital signs, about being able to uh, control patients that are coming in shock, different types of shock, but also ventilation, oxygen. There are very, like only two hospitals in the country have pipe oxygen. So most of the oxygen administered in any regional or district hospital is through oxygen concentrators. And sometimes if you are lucky and you have an oxygen factory, some canisters that we can fill in. So as my colleague, Professor Mervyn was saying before, we try to do our best with the small, but we end up reaching and, uh, and, and, and getting many, many good outcomes. And that's what has happened in the country. From 2,300 cases, uh, we only had 74 deaths so far. And also this means that we have been able to develop systems. We have not, we don't have a specialist in, in ICU to be able to do much ventilation, at least mechanical ventilation. But we have over expanded the use of CPAP, the use of high flow oxygen. Um, we have been able to train a new generation of healthcare workers in how to manage critical cases, how to do 
a, like a good monitoring and close a care of patients with high dependency units. And in our case with 34 military, we have been able to set up from what it was uh, an Ebola treatment center with 30 beds, we have transformed and transitioned it into 30 beds of ICU for COVID, where we work with oxygen concentrators of five liters, 10 liters, oxygen uh, canisters that we refill in our oxygen factories, but also we put CPAPs in patients that are coming with more severe respiratory uh, insufficiency and respiratory distress. So now being trying to get ready for the second wave, right now in the last days, we have not reported any case in the country, which should not give us too much confidence or complacent because we know that sometimes the waves come a little bit later. But what we can definitely say in Sierra Leone is Ebola taught us a big lesson about how to manage infectious diseases, as well as other vertical programs like TB, HIV, in terms of contact tracing, surveillance, et cetera, IPC, and, and also PPE use. But now we need to get ready for the second wave, just being able to witness what is happening now in Europe, US, in, and Asia, and trying to put our big improvement in the healthcare system and the capacity of the healthcare workers in managing critical care and trying to get as much um, operations and, and medical equipment available now that we have seen that with just like oxygen, heparins, steroids, and, and a good monitoring and a good high dependency unit with close monitoring of the patients, we are able to make most of our patients survive. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lado. And we're pleased that you have recently joined WHO and will be using your experience from Sierra Leone to drive our work uh, on clinical, on clinical uh, case uh, management. Uh, muchas gracias. That caps uh, three amazing stories. And there are many lessons from the Republic of Korea, South Africa, and Sierra Leone that can help other countries suppress the virus save lives and protect health workers and hospitals. It really reinforces that while some countries are putting in place measures to ease the pressure on the health system, there is also now an opportunity to build stronger systems, ensuring quality testing, tracing and treatment measures are implemented are all key. And we need countries to gain, to again invest in the basics so that measures can be lifted safely and governments can hopefully have these measures again. On a macro level, this also reflects why a whole of government, whole of society approach to sustainable global preparedness is so important. Health systems and preparedness are not only an investment in the future, they are the foundation of our response today. Public health is more than medicine and science, and it's bigger than any individual. And there is hope that if we invest in health systems, health workers, uh, and share tools uh, through the ACT Accelerator, we can bring this virus under control and go forward together to tackle other challenges of our time. We have to keep going, and whether I'm at home or in the office, uh, WHO will keep working to drive forward science, solutions, and solidarity. I thank you. Fadila, back to you. Thank you, Dr. Tedros, and thank you to our guests. Um, I will now open the floor to questions from uh, journalists. I remind you that you will need to raise your hand under the raise your hand function in order to get in the queue to ask your question. I would like now to invite Isabel Sacco from EFE, the Spanish News Agency, to ask the first question. Isabel, can you hear me? Yes, uh, thank you, Fadela. Uh, good evening. Uh, I would like to ask uh, your comments on the protests in several parts of Europe against the COVID restrictions decided by governments. Do you see them as a sign that people did not yet understand the gravity of the situation that we are living? Thank you. Um, 
Yes, uh, we, we've seen uh, m many protests ar ar around the world uh, in association with, uh, with restrictions uh, from time to time. And clearly, uh, you know, people are uh, frustrated and they have every right to be frustrated and, and, and uh, they're fatigued and they want, as we all do, to get back to our normal lives. Um, and every, people have every right to question uh, when uh, authorities indicate that certain measures need to be taken. But we would prefer that to be seen as a dialogue between governments and communities so that we can reach a consensus on what needs to be done. Uh, it's really important that governments reach out to all levels of society to do that and have dialogue. Uh, sometimes governments have to act quickly and in doing so uh, it can cause uh, a reaction at the community level. Uh, communities have a right to process. It's a very important part of modern society. Uh, governments don't always get it right and, uh, and, and also need, like ourselves, to be, to be accountable for our activities. So protest is good as long as that protest is safe that protest is managed in a way that it doesn't increase COVID risk. Uh, and obviously, we would hope that such protests would be civil, non-violent, uh, and respect uh, the, 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 the basic uh, rule of law, uh, and that no other uh, civilians and others are drawn in. So yes, we support the idea of protest and the idea of speaking out, uh, and we understand people's frustrations. but. Governments in Europe in particular at this time are facing a very, very difficult situation. You can argue how we've got into this situation, but you can't argue that the situation is serious. We need to push this virus down. We need to take the heat out of this epidemic right now in Europe. And governments have limited options right now in how to do that. Their options are limited. Their options may get easier if we get some success, but right now governments face very limited options. Uh, we would ask you to challenge, yes, your governments, but please support those decisions that governments make uh, that are really, I think, aimed at trying to protect populations, trying to help people, uh, and we hope that any measures that have been put in place are short-lived, are based on the epidemiologic need, uh, and are the least disruptive possible. Thank you, Dr. Ryan. I would like now to invite uh, Carmen Pound from Politico to ask the next, next question. Carmen, can you hear me? Carmen? Can you please unmute yourself? Yes. Can you hear me well now? Very well. Go ahead, Carmen. Thank you so much for giving me the floor. I have a question for Professor um, Ye Jen about the flu season. Um, there have been concerns in many parts of the Northern Hemisphere about a so-called twindemic with flu and coronavirus. And I was wondering if she has any indication so far in South Korea about the numbers of the flu cases and how they compare to last year this time or whether we're seeing a similar situation as in the Southern Hemisphere where, you know, there were very few cases of flu because, because of the, of the um, precautionary measures taken against, um, against the coronavirus. And if I may also question on, um, for, for uh, probably uh, Dr. Chedros about um, the U.S. funding for the WHO, I was wondering if there's been any sort of like assessment so far on how the freezing of funds from the U.S. side will impact the work of the WHO. And I also take this opportunity to wish Dr. Chedros um, the best, and hopefully he will, he will feel well and, and be able to get out of quarantine soon. Thank you. Thank you, Carmen. I would like to invite uh, Professor Kim. Uh, I know it's very late uh, in her country, but you are still with us. Do you mind taking this question, please? Sure. Um, so at the moment, um, we have not started at the typical flu season yet, although we are entering and we are vaccinating people for the preparation for winter. Typically, we see the flu, flu, flu patients, you know, probably in sometime in November and we see the increasing number of patients in December and January, typically in Korea in the past. So we do not know whether we will have the similar situation like in the Southern Hemisphere during the summertime, they have a low number of cases. However, we are trying to do our best 
to prepare the population with um, vaccination at the moment. So at the moment, we do not see any signs of a significant increase of influenza in the community. Thank you, Professor Kim. Um, Dr. Maria von Berkow would like to add something. Yes, thank you. And, and hello, Dr. Kim. It's really nice to see you on the screen. Um, and thank you for, for joining us today. Dr. Kim and I know each other for, for a few years now uh, based on our experiences together with, uh, with MERS coronavirus. And I'm very grateful that um, Korea has, has really demonstrated uh, lessons learned um, from experience with MERS in 2015. So thank you, Dr. Kim, and for all of this, the speakers today. Um, so just to, just to highlight the, the question around influenza and the influenza season uh, in the Northern Hemisphere. So as we are beginning the season here in the Northern Hemisphere, there are surveillance systems that are in place um, to be able to test, uh, to see which uh, influenza viruses are circulating. Um, those, those systems are strong. We need to make sure that in countries in the Northern Hemisphere, we are still testing for influenza as well as testing for COVID-19. Um, the restrictions that are in place for COVID-19 will be beneficial for influenza, um, but we don't know yet um, how the influenza season will unfold. Um, the good news for influenza is that we can be prepared for this, and we are preparing for this. There is a vaccine um, that is rolling out for influenza, um, and we, we strongly urge um, those in the at-risk groups to make sure that they get vaccine, uh, vaccinated this year. Um, and there is all, also substantial work underway around making sure that patients enter the right clinical care pathway as they enter the, the public health system. And Dr. Diaz is here who can, who can comment a little bit more on that because it is important uh, the type of care that individuals receive depending on if they have COVID-19 or if they have influenza. Um, so it will be difficult to distinguish what an individual has in terms of their symptoms because the signs and symptoms are very similar. Um, so entering that clinical care pathway early and making sure that patients receive the care that they need uh, will, will save lives. Um, Janet? Thank you. Um, and this is a very uh, important um, question and also important to be uh, prepared and ready. I think as you start to think about influenza coming into the community, um, obviously the surveillance is key, uh, recognizing when influenza starts to circulate or is circulating in the community. So you put it on, the clinicians have to put it on their differential diagnosis when evaluating someone with an acute respiratory infection. We do know that the symptoms are uh, common in, uh, that both diseases do have common symptoms, but we do know some differences. And one of the differences I think I wanted to highlight is that those are at risk for influenza include there are some overlapping risks, uh, risk for severe disease, but then there are, there are some that are more unique to influenza. So young children are at increased risk for severe disease with influenza, and one must remember that. The second one is pregnant women. Pregnant women are at risk for severe disease with influenza, and so you have to remember that, including up to postpartum two weeks. So those are two groups that are not, we are not seeing severe disease in COVID-19, but so, so, so that is clear. So when you're starting to see influenza circulating, don't forget that. So if someone with an acute respiratory infection and you suspect influenza is in the differential and they're a young child or they're pregnant, then that patient actually does need to be tested. And why do we test for influenza? We test for influenza because we do have uh, antivirals that work for influenza. So right now, the WHO is soon to publish their, uh, our guidance on influenza. Um, and, but we do know that there are antivirals, such as oseltamivir, that uh, if you give to patients who are at risk or with severe disease, does reduce mortality. And so that is our recommendation. So we have an antiviral that would be used for patients that are either at risk or with severe disease for influenza, and that is a different than what we know for COVID-19. Again, uh, there's another difference perhaps is, is the use of, you know, corticosteroids. You know, so corticosteroids right now for the for the treatment of COVID-19, we know it reduces mortality in patients with severe and critical COVID-19. But the risk of corticosteroids in influenza, there has been some concern that that can actually increase viral replication. So the same data doesn't exist for that. So I think what's important now is to, one, is to understand when it starts to circulate in the community. Two, to put it on your differential diagnosis. Know the differences in severity. Know the differences in uh, 
treatment pathways, but then there are some other commonalities. If the patients with influenza or COVID-19 develop severe pneumonia, need oxygen therapy, need intensive care, then the best practices are the best practices, good supportive care, good patient monitoring, safe practices in intensive care unit, appropriate application of IPC within the healthcare setting in order to um, you know, prevent any nosocomial transmission. So then there are those commonalities. So thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Diaz. I would like now to invite Emma Farge from Reuters to ask the next question. Emma, can you hear me? I can hear you. Uh, good afternoon. My question is for Dr. Tedros, please. Um, it's regarding your quarantine. Can you give any indication of whether the COVID-19 positive person you're in touch with is from within the WHO? And if so, is there a cluster of transmission within the agency and, and how big is it? Um, and more broadly, can you comment on whether this encounter is affecting the operations at headquarters? Will you be testing staff? or potentially even closing headquarters? What is the plan? Thank you very much. Um, I'll take the, the first part. The, the DG may wish to comment, but just to reassure you that our staff health and welfare uh, program under the leadership of Dr. Caroline Cross and, and uh, um, Raul Thomas, the head of business operations, have had in place a very extensive uh, case detection and contact tracing system covering our staff since the very beginning uh, of this uh, epidemic. Uh, and uh, we have had uh, a number of cases through that time. Most cases have been acquired at community level, uh, very few uh, within, within the building here, but uh, we've been very vigilant in, in maintaining, uh, number one, reducing the footprint of staff in the office, moving very much to teleworking, uh, all of the things you've seen elsewhere, hand washing stations, limitations on the number of people per office, limitations in meeting rooms, the, the wearing of masks um, in open spaces and, and many other initiatives that have been incrementally added in order to manage the risks uh, to our staff, both in the building and in the community. And remember, we're part of a community here at WHO too, both on the Swiss side of the border and the French side of the border. Our staff live in the community, their children go to local schools, we, we shop. Uh, we pray, we do all the other things that people want to do. So we are part of that community and we're subject to the same risks that exist in those communities. Uh, the staff have been very, very vigilant in, in implementing uh, those measures. We have temperature checks on arrival in the building, self-declaration uh, of health status every single day for all staff members and an immediate response mechanism should someone become ill at home or become ill at the office. I'll pass to Maria maybe for some of the, the detail, um, but just to assure you that we, like any uh, building and any organization, both here at our regional offices and our country offices, have in place uh, strong and robust risk management mechanisms in order to reduce transmission within the building and to manage that transmission should it occur. This is not a zero risk situation. We've said it again and again. There is no environment right now in the world that is without risk. We believe we have put in place appropriate and robust risk management measures that balance the risks of the disease against our need to provide the services that we must provide to our member states and the world. Maria? I think only to add that, you know, we're an organization just like everyone else, uh, you know, in the world trying to work this out and how we keep our staff safe and how we have the systems in place uh, within the building, but also making sure that everybody takes the steps that they need to take throughout the day. Uh, we're all uh, everyday people as well, and we live in homes and apartments, and we have to grocery shop, and we have to take our kids to the doctors and all of that. So everything that we have put in place, everything that we are recommending to the world, we are putting in place here as well. Um, and so, as Mike has said, um, uh, we are tracking all of the, the cases that are happening uh, with amongst staff, um, doing contact tracing forward, doing contact tracing backwards to make sure we understand how people were infected, um, and making sure uh, that transmission is not taking place. Uh, we haven't had any transmission take place on the premises. Uh, we have no clusters on the, on the premises. Um, but it is something we're monitoring every day. So we are always looking at the systems we have in the rooms we have and, and the spacing and the, and the work staff, um, and that is something that we will continue to do. But I'm sure every business, uh, every office is having similar discussions. Um, but make sure that you have a plan in place in your own uh, place of business um, so that you know what it is that you need to do as a staff member but also as an employer uh, to support your staff should someone uh, be a case and require care 
and also to support to provide supported quarantine for those who need to who are con, uh, contacts of confirmed cases so that they could be supported through the 14 day quarantine period. Thank you uh, both. Um, I would like now to invite Jordan Kelly Linden from The Telegraph to ask the next question. Jordan, can you hear me? Hiya. Um, can you hear me? Yes, very well. Go ahead, please. Um, a petition has been widely circulating calling for global guidelines on indoor humidity to be drawn up amid concerns that dry weather air could provide a perfect storm for successful coronavirus transmission. The petition calls for regulations on indoor air quality to include a humidity level of 40 to 60 percent relative humidity. Is the WHO aware of this petition? Has the WHO considered this? And what does the organisation think of the evidence suggesting um, SARS-CoV-2 transmits more effectively in dry air? So thank you for the question. Uh, yes, uh, we are aware of that petition that's been circulating for some time. Um, you need to, th there's different ways in which relative humidity affect the, the ability for the virus to spread. Um, if you have low relative humidity, that will favor uh, survival of the viruses on surfaces, for example. But if you have high relative humidity, it can favor uh, respiratory droplet circulation or suspension of droplets in the air. Um, we have been working with the Global Heat Health Information Network, uh, which is a combination of researchers from WHO, the World Meteorological Organization, and the U.S. National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration in the U.S. Um, and have set some um, guidance on ideal temperatures for rooms and also ideal relative humidity of between 50 and 60 percent. Um, so within our networks, um, we discuss a number of factors that can reduce transmission um, indoors um, and outdoors and everywhere. And we do know that there are situations in which transmission can be amplified, which is why you hear us speak a lot about trying to avoid um, enclosed spaces, indoor spaces, and, and spaces with poor ventilation. And you've heard, you hear us speak a lot about making sure that we improve ventilation as one of the measures um, that could be put in place um, to help reduce transmission of, of this virus. So it is one of the factors that we are looking at uh, and we will continue to, uh, to look at. Thank you. I would like now to invite uh, Chen from China Daily to ask the next question. Chen, can you hear me? Yes, very well. I have a question for Professor King and maybe the other two experts if they want to weigh in. Uh, you know, the I'm actually based in Brussels uh, under the new lockdown. Uh, so the Europe and the United States are again the new epicenters. So if European Union leaders and the US leaders come to seek your advice and you don't have to be too polite, what would you tell them they have done wrong and to cause a second wave? And if you, know, you, you, if you follow their uh, measures uh, recently to tackle the second wave. Are you thinking they are doing things right to maybe there won't be a third wave before Christmas? Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Shen. Uh, Professor Kim, are you still online? Yes, I am online, and it's a very challenging question, and I am not sure whether I have wise answers for that question. And um, as we all already experienced this uh, during this pandemic, uh, this virus uh, in many ways was unexpected. Uh, and it, we were actually learn, uh, learning more about this virus just following the track of the virus. So I, I am not sure whether at this point we are, uh, we can say what, what uh, who did wrong, who did uh, what wrong. And it's actually at this point, what we need to do is um, collect and collect our wisdom and also uh, pick up all the lessons that we learned so far. And we are uh, preparing for the future and with a more collab collaborative way. I think that would be the um, uh, way to go for the future. And also there are some uh, hopeful news about the uh, vaccine trials and uh, the um, 
uh, treatment uh, regimen, things like that. So we, uh, until we have really more good weapons, we try to uh, slow down the epidemic. I think that's the way to go. So uh, uh, I think we, when we um, when we uh, when we share our wisdom and knowledge. I think we can overcome this uh, virus eventually and slow down the virus and we will have more options in the future for the treatment and uh, better outcome. That's only what I can say. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Kim. Um, it's a very good answer. Um, I do want to take this opportunity to highlight a few things that we think countries can be doing right now, especially as it relates to the topic at hand today where we're talking about uh, clinical care, we're talking about the, the use of medical facilities to be able to care for patients. And I think one of the challenges that we're seeing across North America and across Europe is that the increases in cases, the increases in hospitalization, the increases in ICU are happening at the same time. In the spring, there was some staggering of this, of this increase, um, but it's happening at, at, in many countries at the same time, where many systems are becoming overwhelmed at the same time. So that poses challenges for countries that were able to move facilities and move workforce around to help uh, manage uh, the intense, most intense areas. WHO has outlined a number of tools and a number of guidance that I'm gonna run through very quickly right now because I think these can be helpful in uh, dealing with this peak that we're seeing right now across, across Europe and across North America. We have a number of tools that have been established, and these have been revised over time, which are essentially calculators. These are calculators for tools to help um, plan for the workforce that is needed um, for clinical care, um, for the supplies that are needed, including, including therapeutics and, and medicines, in terms of oxygen, in terms of beds, and different types of beds that are needed for different levels of clinical care, and in terms of uh, personal protective equipment that is needed. These calculators can be used again um, looking at what is needed for this increase and for building this surge capacity. We also have a number of tools which is working on expanding your capacity that you have right now. So even countries that have brought transmission under control, you've, you, you've heard from our speakers today, they're still expanding capacity. And in many countries that are seeing intense transmission right now need to continue to expand clinical care capacity. Whether this is restructuring of, of current facilities that you have to manage patient flow, whether this is about repurposing facilities that exist and buildings that exist that can either care for those who are on the more mild end of the spectrum, taking off some pressure from your hospitals that need to provide more advanced care, or whether this is building facilities. We have guidance out that can help build SARI treatment centers, severe acute respiratory uh, treatment centers. Um, and we have seen a number of countries that have actually built, purpose built, built um, facilities for COVID, which will be beneficial for, for infectious diseases in the long run. We also have a number of training packages that are out that will protect the workforce. So providing adequate training for infection prevention and control when caring for, for patients who are suspected to have COVID or who have COVID through the various levels of their illness. Uh, in particular, if you need to do um, aerosol generating procedures, for example. And you've heard um, from one of our speakers that there's a new generation of health workers that are being trained. This needs to continue to happen because our workforce is overwhelmed, overburdened already, um, and they're quite exhausted. Um, so to be able to provide that support. We also have a new screening guidance that's out for screening, identification, and management of healthcare worker infections um, because, of course, they are health workers are most at risk of infection because they are directly dealing with patients who are infected with this virus. So this is a, a mixture of infection prevention and control procedures as well as occupational health and safety. We also have a number of guidance out across the public health spectrum to help countries deal with uh, community transmission. So this is prioritized surveillance activities, this is prioritized testing strategies, because in situations where you can't do the, the level of testing that you might want to do, you may have to prioritize those research, uh, those, those resources. 
Um, and I think the last thing is that we keep hearing from all of our speakers, from all of our member states, that it's the, the flexibility of the system to be able to cope as you increase your need or decrease your need um, as needed and learning from the experience that you have because countries are not in the same position that they were in previously. We know a lot more now about uh, caring for patients and that is saving lives. We just need to ensure that the medical system doesn't get overwhelmed um, so that we can provide the adequate care that is, that is necessary. So we will be um, repackaging this guidance that already exists in a way so we can put it on our website so that countries can, can go directly to this and see what are the surge materials that are necessary. But there's a lot of existing guidance that is there. You have a lot of experience yourself. So really utilize your knowledge and your management um, from the spring into the current season now. But it is time to scale up. Um, and it is time to continue to scale up and, and be at that ready. Thank you. Uh, you would like now to invite uh, Bloomberg News, Corinne Gretler, to ask the last question. Corinne, can you hear me? I can hear you. Thank you. It's a very short one for Dr. Tedros. I uh, just wanted to ask if you have been tested or if you're going to be tested or if you're waiting for symptoms, if they do show up. Thank you, Corinne. Yeah, the, uh, the current protocols in WHO are that uh, people who are determined to be contacts of a confirmed case uh, are, are uh, asked to quarantine uh, for the period of time required. Uh, that is the, the standard protocol and that is what uh, Dr. Tedros is, uh, is uh, the regime he's under right now. Uh, the, the test, his testing will, will depend on, on the arrival of symptoms or otherwise, and, and he may be tested in the days to come. But our current protocols don't require that, uh, that, he, be, that he be tested. He is uh, at home in quarantine, and as you can see very well, and working away and continuing to do his job uh, in supporting the world. And we, uh, the staff of WHO, extend our, our congratulations to our chief uh, for becoming a grandfather. Uh, it is wonderful to see new life in the world uh, as we face so much death and uh, it gives us hope uh, and we congratulate him and his family, his, his uh, sons and, and daughters and, and uh, daughter-in-laws um, so that uh, it, it's just good news for us all. But uh, as I said, uh, we will, we will uh, Dr. Tedros will monitor his own condition. He will be monitored by our staff health and welfare team and he will be attested as necessary at the appropriate time. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ryan. Um, I think we passed the hour, so it's time to close this uh, press conference. Um, just uh, to check if Dr. Uh, Tedros is still online for his final words. We lost him. Um, I, I think we'll, uh, uh, Dr. Tedros has been obviously cut off. I, we didn't have any questions for uh, Dr. Mary Angela Simao or Samia Swaminathan today, but uh, I will remark on the fact that it is remarkable and uh, a wonderful sign of the times to be surrounded by uh, four absolutely outstanding female uh, scientists and doctors. It's also quite, uh, quite intimidating. Now I, I know what Dr. Tedros feels like sometimes. Uh, so uh, uh, I'm sure we'll have more questions on the ACT Accelerator, on the science and the R&D side in the days to come. Uh, thank you all for your attention. Bye-bye. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ryan. Uh, just reminding journalists that we will be sending the audio file and the DG speech just after uh, the uh, press conference. The full transcript will be posted on the W2 website tomorrow morning. If you have any follow-up questions, don't hesitate, please, to contact the media team. Um, Dr. Tedros, would you like to uh, say a few words before we close formally this press conference? Dr. Tedros, you have the floor. <laughs> We can't hear you. Please unmute yourself.
<laughs> Dr. Tedros, uh, we cannot hear you. I don't think we can. I don't think he can. Yes. Uh, um, okay. Thank you, Dr. Tedros. Um, we will see you uh, very, you very shortly in the next press. Ah, you, you are now? back. You are back. <laughs> yeah, because I was unmuted, I think, from the center. That's why I, I just had a look at So thank you so much. I, I would like to thank all uh, who have joined us today. Uh, to Professor uh, Yajon, uh, to Professor Mer, and also to Dr. Uh, Lado. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your experience from South Korea, South Africa, and, and Sierra Leone. And uh, thank you also to our uh, colleagues, to all uh, journalists who have joined today. And see you in our next presser. And thank you also for your uh, good, good wishes. Uh, uh, from uh, which you just expressed uh, since yesterday, and I'm, I'm very, very grateful for that. Thank you. Thank you, DG.